The path of the artificer is one that is arduous, sometimes tedious, but immensely rewarding. As the artificer hones their craft, they learn how to take ordinary man-made materials, bend them to their will, and craft them into wonders. Such was the case with the van that served as the home and base of operations for Ayer and Winterlich general services. As Colette entered the vehicle, she found it to be much bigger on the inside, filled with stacks upon stacks of merchandise, as well as a mirror, a few shelves of books and trinkets, and even a comfy-looking green sofa. As the van rattled down the road, Colette took a seat next to Eisen, and the two of them sat in awkward silence for a moment before he finally decided to address her. Oh, all right. If you're going to be staying here, I guess I better show you the ins and outs. Do you know anything about horseless vans? Well, back when I lived in Crystal Great. City... Great, forget all about it, because this baby is one of a kind. This is the main room. This is where we keep most of our merchandise, as well as a general sitting area. It's the only area. Oi, what did I just tell you a second ago? Forget all of it? Exactly. Congratulations. Now, here is where you get to the rest of it. Eisen motioned over to a door in the side of the van, one which wasn't visible from the outside, and which Colette hadn't noticed before Eisen pointed it out. It had a crank on the side, like you might see in an elevator, marked with the numbers 1 to 4. <laughs> this is what we call the multi-door patent pending. Very, very cool piece of kit. It's how you get access to the other rooms. You pull the crank, and depending on the number you line it up with, that'll be the room you get to. Like so. Kitchen. Bathroom. Bedroom. Extra storage. There you go, that's the tour. Oh, you gave her the tour without me? What the? <gasps> you are a menace, you know that. If you're back here with us, who's driving? Don't worry about it. Now, most of the cleaning supplies will be in the storage area, as well as a ringer and a washboard. And the laundry soap is under the sink in the bathroom. You can take care of every room but the kitchen. Don't touch the kitchen. Telsey is very possessive. No, oh no. I'm not a maid, and you're not getting me to do all your busy work unless you intend to pay me. Eh, uh, I don't know about that. We did say we'd be taking you on as a temporary third partner. That involves you doing your fair share of work. If that arrangement doesn't suit, well, we can always drop you back at your hometown. Aye, I'm sure Ariadne would be excited to see you again, don't you think? Hey, that's extortion. Uh, actually, I think it's blackmail. It's blackmail, right? Yes. Thank you. Now, we have a meeting in Hundekoff tonight to inquire about a job. Tell us for and I will go in and do the talking. You can busy yourself with dusting while we do so. Think you can manage that, sweetheart? Think you can manage my boot up your ass? Oh, come now, both of you. There's no need to be so combative. Miss Geis, rest assured your assistance won't go unpaid. You'll be given food and board as compensation for as long as you are here with us. Well, hopefully you'll fare better than the last assistant we took on. Both men then solemnly turned their heads towards a shrunken head nailed to the wall. Ah, poor, poor Fritz. Fritz. So young. I so young, guy. All right. I concede to your demands. I guess. Since it seems to be the only option right now. <laughs> Great to hear. Now, <laughs> go take a shower. You smell like mantle of piss. For those unfamiliar with the traditions of Valorian magic, it may not be immediately evident just how significant and unusual the blue colour of the Kingmaker's light would have been to those who saw it. There are, as there have been since time immemorial, four schools of magic taught in the country's many specialised vocational colleges. For reasons still unknown to science, each type of magic produces a specific and unique wavelength of light when wielded. This has led to very strong colour associations that became deeply ingrained into Valorian culture. Artificer spells glow green, mentalism spells glow purple, nature spells glow yellow, and fleshcraft, as you no doubt have guessed on your own, glows red. So to a Valorian, seeing a sudden flash of bright light in any of those colours would not be completely unheard of. But the Kingmaker's light was none of these shades, which led all those who saw it to ask one 
salient question. What the hell is blue? What? Shh. All right, she won't hear us now. Blue. That little flash light that came off the Kingmaker when Collect raised her voice. It was blue. Nothing's blue. What the hell is blue? Yes, it did seem strange. It got me thinking. When you worked in the castle, did you ever see Arm Brilliant? I was on the kitchen staff, eyes, and I wasn't exactly called into the war room all that often. Aye, but you know of it, right? Vaguely. Well, let me tell you something. When I was with the militia, that thing was our number one enemy. It took us years to plan out to get into the castle and disable it. I never saw it in action because people who did didn't live to tell about it. But, according to records, the beam of light that it shot out when it was activated was blue. So you think that had something to do with the Kingmaker? It makes sense, doesn't it? A doomsday weapon needs a power source. And it'll certainly increase its resale value. <laughs> Once again, your desire to make money clouds your ability to see the big picture. If the Kingmaker was the power source for the Arm Brilliante, then we are, as of today, the two most powerful men in Valor. We just have to figure out how to turn it on. And being a man of science, Eisen knew that the best way to confirm or deny a hypothesis was through rigorous scientific testing. Throughout the day, as Colette busied herself with the chores that her two companions had asked her to do, Eisen subtly exposed her to a number of external stressors. Projectiles? Ow! Where'd the screw come from? No results. Cold temperatures? <laughs> oh no, I tripped. God, that's freezing! No results. Heat? Colette, could you stay still for a moment and, uh... No, no, wait! It's for science! It, it's for science! Come back! Come on! I'm not gonna set you on fire! <laughs> not intentionally. Results inconclusive. This pattern continued in more or less the same fashion until they got to their destination. Hunderkopf translates to dog's head in German, the language of the Valorian peasantry before the Feverites made it the official national language in the 1890s. The city was so named for an incident that took place in 1672, where a dispute between two rival publicans led to one man killing the other's prize hunting dog and impaling it on a signpost just outside city limits. The body rotted away in the intense period of rain that struck in the spring of that year, but the head remained stuck up there, as none of the city officials wanted to touch it. Before this event, the city was known as St. Augustine, but eventually that name fell out of use as more and more people started knowing it by the mounted dog skull than by the actual words on the map. Ask anybody who has been to Hunderkopf and they'll tell you, the name suits the place. Would you mind continuing this argument somewhere that isn't a public thoroughfare, please? Hey, hey fuck, fuck you. you! I don't have time for this. Hey, you could have killed us. You okay? Fuck you. Okay, tell us Ford and I are going to meet our contact, and I highly recommend that you stay in the van for the entire time we do. Hundekov on a weekend is... Well, it's kinda... It's that. I see. The locks on the doors are charmed, so anyone who touches them will forget what they were doing and lose interest. But, if you still feel unsafe... I don't know. There's probably a pistol in one of the merchandise crates if you dig around and look for them, but you'll be fine. Unless the person breaking in is also an artificer and they know how to counter the charm on the locks and could use magic to rip the gun right out of your hand. Which is a very specific series of events. And it hasn't happened. Yet. But if it does, you can hide in the wardrobe in our bedroom. But don't sit on the bed. And don't look through any of the drawers. There's leftover mantelope steak in the icebox. Right. See you in a couple of hours. <laughs> How long? <sighs> Great.
great. Colette naturally deeply resented the reception she'd been given so far. She had half a mind to run off like she'd done back in her convent school days, but she knew better than to risk her life on the streets of Hunderkopf. So instead, she took a small amount of childlike joy in messing about in Eisen and Telesphore's things. Let's see. One for the kitchen. Two for bathroom. Jackpot! Three for bedroom! Did someone say I wasn't allowed to sit on the bed? Hmm... I can't remember. Guess I'll just assume I'm allowed to. Oh, it's so soft. God, why do two thieves who live in a van have a nicer mattress than me? What was that about going through the drawers? I'm welcome to? Oh, well, Mr. Iyer, if you insist. Ooh, a quarter mark. I'm taking that, thank you. The Navy boys on shore leave. Oh, there are pictures. Iyer's side of the wardrobe. Pathetic. 1874 called. They'd like all their clothes back. And here are all of Winterlich's clothes. Well, at least he's got good taste in suits. I'll give him that. Whoa, this shirt is like a dress on me. Ugh, smells like cigar smoke. <gasps> oh, they have a gramophone! Two men shot each other dead that night, mere streets away from where the Iron Winterlich van was parked, and Colette was none the wiser. She was safely hidden away in a magically soundproofed room, listening to Sophie Tucker and reading nautical pornography. About an hour and a half later, Aya and Winterlich themselves were walking back from their meeting, discussing the days ahead. You could have bargained the price higher. Those incendiary rounds were worth so much more than 2,000. Oh, whoa, wait, hey, hey. You want to haggle Maxim Moritz? Be my guest. Sounds like you've had a hard day at work, boys. Maybe I could persuade you to come down to the Ruby Rabbit and meet Sorry, ma'am. Right. We're homosexuals. Have a very good evening. Uh, okay. Listen, it doesn't matter. We're going to do this job tomorrow, and I have a feeling we can use it to resolve the whole... Kingmaker situation. Excuse me, gents. Uh, Off oh, Spare a few brook tail for a fella in need. We're six metres away from a gambling den, buddy. We both know if I give you something, you'll immediately lose it. Now piss off. Oh, please, Eisen. There you go. Two marks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You are too nice sometimes. No, you're just cantankerous. Speaking of which, I think we ought to lay off Miss Geis a little. The poor creature did almost die earlier this afternoon. Put it all on black. Nah, she'll be fine. I was in the favourite militia when I was in my twenties. My superiors did way worse to me. That turned out fine. Eh, uh, what's all this about? I didn't want to stay in the cargo bed. Drunk men kept pissing on the van and I could hear them through the wall. That doesn't mean you come into our personal boudoir and drape yourself across the divan like you own the damn place. Are you wearing one of my shirts? Are you reading Navy Boys on Shore Leave? So what if I am? If you want me to respect you, start speaking to me as an equal and not a servant. Then, maybe, you'll have earned it. Listen, I'm very sensitive to the fact that you've had a lot of terrible things happen to you today, so I'm willing to cut you a little slack. But under normal circumstances, I would not be happy about you talking to me like that. Now get out and give Tell us for his shirt back. No, no, she can keep it. Your blouse and skirt are filthy. You ought to have something clean to wear to bed. Oh, well, thanks. At least he's trying to be hospitable. Ah, whatever. When you want to sleep, the sofa folds out. The trio drove out of Hunderkopf as soon as they could 
and found a secluded place to camp for the night. The next day, Eisen explained his plan to Colette. Right. So, the Minister of Construction and Road Maintenance is coming back from a trip to Paris to attend Parliament in Crystal City, and the road he'll be taking is about 10 kilometres south of us. Moretz wants us to intercept him. Why? Because Minister Lebel is a gambling addict who spends a lot of time in Hundkopf. Last time he was here, he pawned an extremely valuable sapphire and gold ring at Mr. Moritz's establishment. But when he couldn't pay the bond, he got a few of his buddies on the police force to rough Moritz up and he took the ring back without paying a single brook tile for it. We have to steal it back. And you're just going to stop his carriage? Ask him to hand it over? Actually, Colette, you're going to be quite instrumental in this heist. Lucky me! All right, so here's what we're going to do. You, Colette, will lay down prone in the dirt. Meanwhile, Tell and I will hide by the side of the road, waiting for the driver to stop and see what's the matter. I don't like how this sounds. Ugh, oh, it'll work. Trust me. Tell us for used to do this bit all the time before you showed up, and he's still alive. It's true. I mean, of course, you're not going to be able to block nearly as much of the road as he did. Oi. Point is, it'll work. Trust me. Reluctantly, Colette took her position. After sleeping in the shirt she'd borrowed from Telesphore, she'd had to change back into her filthy attire from the day previous. She figured she might as well just ruin them by rolling around in the dirt. She lay down in the middle of the road, with her arms folded like a body in a coffin. Not like that, you just look like you're sunbathing. Look more prone. Are you kidding me? No, realism is key. Oh, have mercy. Put that leg there, and bend your neck a little. You have to look like roadkill. I think you'd probably be able to sell the roadkill look better than me, Ayer. Oh, sweetheart, no. This is the role you were born to play. Right, if you need anything, Tell and I will be over there. Break a leg. And with that, the men went to go hide behind a small shrub growing along the side of the road. So, what's this test? to see how the Kingmaker responds to imminent danger. Best case scenario? She blows the minister's carriage up. And worse? Uh, she gets trampled to death by horses. Meanwhile, Colette still lay in the road, getting more bored and more irritated by the minute. Roadkill. <laughs> I should have just taken the terms of Ariadne's deal. To hell with Ire. To hell with Winterlich. Assholes. Maybe I still will take her deal, and my first act as queen will be to order those two to be taken out and shot. Then who's the roadkill, huh? They're lucky I don't have any idea what triggers the blue light, or I swear to God, I blow those bastards to high heaven! For Aizen, this display of the Kingmaker's power was not only proof of his hypothesis, but a resounding win all round. Telesphore, however, was less impressed. Did you see that? Did you see that? Yes! <laughs> the kid's a goddamn powerhouse! Oh, I wish I hadn't seen it. Shit, shit! What the hell happened, Maurice? There's a girl in the road, and we must have rode over a landmine, sir. The horses blew up! Ugh! Obviously, this was some kind of assassination attempt. They knew I'd be taking this road into town. Oh, that's cute. You think you're actually worth assassinating. We are friends of Maxim Moritz. I don't have time for this. Maurice? At his employer's orders, Maurice pulled out the gun he used for defense. But as a gun is a forged weapon, it is of little use in a fight against an artificer. I'll be taking that, thank you very much. Tell, do you want this guy's gun? Oh, I'd love it. Telesphore then pointed the gun at the driver, who immediately raised his arms in surrender. You're a dirty coward, Maurice. No, no, Morris is smart. Because, listen, if you don't hand over that ring that you pawned to our mutual friend, Mr. Moritz, what just happened to that horse of yours is going to happen to you. 
<laughs> That's your cue, mademoiselle. Oh, me? You are the only mademoiselle present. Sorry, chief, I got too into character. Do the thing. What thing? The thing, the pew pew, the zap 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 thing. Okay, okay. Put me on the spot, why don't you? Oh, for crying out loud. Forget it. Look, I'm an artificer with a gun. My friend here is twice your size and could punt you like a javelin. Which hand is the ring on? I'm not telling you. What? I'm firing you, Maurice. Tell, grab his left arm for me. Avec plaisir. Ow! Oh! Ha, got it. See, wasn't that easy. Now, while we're here, I think I'll take your watch. And your cufflinks. And... Kneeing Eisen in the groin and running back to his carriage with no horse would have been a foolish decision on the part of Minister Labelle in any other circumstances. But it just so happened that Maurice, his chauffeur, was actually an accomplished marathon runner who had represented the VSR in the 1904 St. Louis Olympics. Maurice, go! Go, 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 go! <laughs> Maurice was easily able to pick up the hitch and fill in for the horse, and soon the minister and his carriage were disappearing over the horizon. That could have gone better. Hey, that was an amazing display back there, though. In the right circumstances, you're like a one-woman army. <laughs> I'd hug you, but horse blood. Yeah, I need to get some new clothes. Eisen gathered the trio in the back of the van to discuss what had just happened. There was no doubt that something had triggered the blast from the Kingmaker, but it still wasn't exactly clear what. So, the Kingmaker has killed your boss and one horse. Combined, you have a death rate of a centaur. Yes, and hopefully that's the end of it. No promises. All right. So, what do these two events have in common? Was your boss physically attacking you or something? No, she was just standing there. Aha. Uh -huh. So it's not imminent threat. Hmm. Well, it's connected to your brain. Maybe it has something to do with your thoughts. What were you thinking about when you killed your boss? How much I hated the fact that she hadn't given me a raise in ten years. And while you were lying on the road? How much I hate you two for giving me all those stupid orders! Well, that's it then. What? Hatred? Resentment. The specific bitterness of being treated unfairly. If this was the power source for the Arme Brilliant, and it was originally connected to the royal family, then that makes sense. Take it from someone who worked for them, the De Rosier all deeply resented each other, and the staff resented having to put up with them. But nobody could do anything about it but seethe and bitch. So, that crystal was in the Arme Brilliant, passively charging itself on all those negative feelings, waiting for someone to flip the switch on the machine, and turn all that power onto the king's enemies. Exactly. Well, you know what that means. Treat me right, or I might just blow you to pieces. Agreed? <laughs> Agreed. With the mystery of the Kingmaker's power solved, the only thing left for Aya and Winterlich to do was to return to Hundekopf and return the ring to Maxim Moretz. Minister Labelle, meanwhile, arrived in Crystal City, his chauffeur Maurice nearly collapsed of exhaustion. Both seemed crazed, raving to anyone who would listen that they'd lost a horse to an invisible landmine that produced a vibrant blue light. This episode of Kingmaker was written and audio engineered by Meg Malloy Tutton with executive production by Henry Galley. Our music comes courtesy of Vivek Abhishek. This episode featured, in order of appearance, David Alt as the historian, Tukai Nazir as Eisen, Blythe Renee as Colette, Josh Rubino as Telesfor, Zane Schacht as Minister LaBelle, 
and Jamie Douglas as Maurice, with additional voices by Henry Galley, Charlie Porritt, Meg Malloy Tutin, and Gus Sagarella. If you're interested in supporting the show, please follow Kingmaker Pod on Tumblr, Twitter, and Instagram, or search Kingmaker Podcast on Facebook and Patreon. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you again in two weeks. <laughs>